Madam Clerk. All right, good afternoon. Mr. Brennan. Present. Mr. Rickerman. Here. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Present. Mr. Vine. Here. Mr. Davis. Here. Mayor Benjamin. Here. Thank uh, you. Uh, Reverend McDowell, would you uh, please uh, uh, give us the word? Oh, Lord, for all that you've done for us for this day and all of the gracious possibilities you've allowed us to share in. Lord, we ask for your grace and your mercy as we go through this very hectic day. Allow us to feel and sense your presence. We ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you so much. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, with the previous question, Clerk call the roll. Mr. Vernon? Yes. Mr. Wickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Duval? Aye. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Um, in the interest of, uh, of, of time, and we have, uh, of course, several presentations and a whole lot of work to do today, I'm going to keep my, my comments short on the COVID-19 update, other than to say that several of you participated in the uh, committee meetings and also the uh, Economic Recovery Task Force meeting on, on uh, Friday. We, we consumed a lot of information from the committees on, on Friday. Uh, they, uh, the clerk has done a fantastic job along with city staff and and compiling them into your, your workbooks. I would encourage you, of course, they're available to the public on the uh, on the website. Uh, so uh, the full reports of the various committees. Digest, please. We need your input, feedback, constructive criticism, the things that were obviously um, no-brainers, even some of the uh, tougher things. Staff is already way out ahead of us on, some things that we agreed with, uh, had consensus on. Uh, but the digest these and let's make sure we give them a, a appropriate feedback in very short time. So um, uh, uh, thank you, Madam Clerk and, 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 and the city manager and everyone else and the entire team uh, for compiling this information. You know, the reality is that, is that uh, things are changing very rapidly as it relates to the virus, as it relates to the collective response, both nationally, statewide, and, and as a result, of course, our response needs to continue the convention with meeting the needs of the people uh, in Colombia and across the Midlands. We made a commitment. We've been ahead of the curve. Let's stay ahead of the curve. But let's do a deep dive uh, into this. Obviously, uh, my colleagues in council, this is our first time seeing each other. We also had the opportunity to meet um, uh, in the executive session earlier. I did want to make it uh, clear, and we're going to make a, a more formal statement later, uh, later on, uh, that we had a fantastic evaluation of both our city manager and our, and our city attorney. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, multiple years in a row, uh, um, exceeding expectations, and, and certainly uh, we made. I made some public comment about Teresa in an article a few a few weeks ago that there was a consensus. Uh, she's a great manager on, on every day. She's an excellent manager in crisis, and uh, we we have uh, uh, evaluated uh, Teresa your performance as well as Teresa Knox's, and we want to uh, encourage you to continue doing the great work you're doing on behalf of the city. We do know that we have not raised compensation for you guys over the last several years. We're going to come back to that when when, when things are more clear. We we have a real um, a real eye on the overall economic condition of of, of the municipal corporation as a city, and obviously uh, 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 consistent with the with the sentiment of our, of our citizens who are all working through difficult times. And we appreciate you all working with us. But keep up the great work. You're kicking butt and taking names. You're there when we need you. And, um, and just want to make sure I made that made a public comment about that. So thank you. And, Much appreciated, uh, Mayor and Council. Absolutely. Y'all keep up. They keep up the great work. Um, so um, let's let's go ahead and go straight into the uh, the council discussions. Uh, Madam City Manager. Yes, sir. And as we do that, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to wish Mr. Davis a belated happy birthday. I think that's an order, maybe from yesterday, Mr. Davis. <laughs> How'd you find out? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Little birdie told me. <laughs> hey. Well, happy belated birthday to you, Teresa. You yes, have, sir. You have, you have yeah, a, okay. Monday as well, right? It's Sunday. Yes, sir. We, Mr. Davis and I were born just minutes apart. That's all. <laughs> okay. 
few okay. hours. <laughs> same same day. That's right. <laughs> Happy belated to both 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 of you. May God uh, so many many more. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Well, we will uh, be uh, try to be as brief as possible, Mayor. These are two really important topics, though, under the COVID nineteen update. But I do want to get you all. My goal is to get you complete with um, this session and the executive session by four thirty, being that you will go into session again this evening for a publicly noticed uh, zoning public hearing and a consent agenda at six. So with that said, we will have Mr. Henry Simons, our assistant city manager for operations, to discuss with council our phased reopening approach for our park amenities. We know this um, is of a lot of interest to our citizens. Henry. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wilson, for your uh, opening comments. And uh, thank you, Mayor Benjamin, city council for providing us with an opportunity to discuss um, a proposed reopening of our parks and recreation. Henry, hold on one second. Can somebody go on mute? There's some brown talk. I don't know if it, it, it's a lot. Uh, it's somebody linked in, but it's it's ringing. Yeah, it's a um, uh, the Central Council and, and the um, clerk and city manager um, and whoever's presenting. Let's see if we can all um, mute our phones or uh, computers. All right. Super duper. All right. All right, so um, as, you, as you all know, our parks uh, facilities and amenities have been closed since March 16th. And of course, this decision was made um, out, of, out of an abundance of caution to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and to protect our team members and citizens. However, uh, today uh, we would like to share a recommendation of a phased approach to uh, reopening uh, our facilities and amenities. Uh, so on May 6th, uh, myself and our parks and rec uh, leadership team had an opportunity to listen to uh, a panel discussion that was hosted by the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and the subject was, uh, can summer sports and recreation programs open safely? And I want to thank Mayor Benjamin for recommending that we take part in this session. Uh, what we've learned from that session is, in summary, is this. Um, follow the CDC guidelines and evaluate your program reopening uh, and based on your health organization, which is inclusive of DHEC and how COVID-19 has impacted your city. Uh, they did stress that the process needs to be slow and gradual uh, with effective communication regarding training expectations uh, for your staff as well as citizens. Uh, so we believe that uh, this plan supports those recommendations and also supports our council's position on the interest of making decisions based on public health. Uh, we also wanna keep in mind that reopening our Facilities and amenities is subject to change um, at any time based on the COVID-19 data. Uh, so the following outlines a phased plan to reopen the city of uh, Columbia Parks and Recreation facilities and amenities. So phase one uh, is already complete. Um, phase one uh, took place on May 12th, which is the outdoor opening of uh, or the opening of the outdoor greenway, greenways and open spaces. Uh, that's already been accomplished. We have received some really good feedback um, from that. So phase two um, is the opening of our tennis courts and athletic fields with some restrictions. Uh, regarding tennis, uh, singles play only, uh, no group lessons, uh, no doubles play. Uh, the actual Columbia Tennis Center and Greenway Tennis Center will open, uh, won't open until phase four. And this is being delayed because these locations are managed by tennis instructors, which include uh, equipment management, um, scheduled training and league play uh, through the USTA uh, Association. Um, so regarding athletic fields, um, as you see in your notes, two or four individuals maximum, members of the same household, um, also with athletic fields, we're asking for no organized play, uh, or no, no organized team activities, pickup games, or team practices. Uh, right now in phase two, uh, these activities will consist of soccer, baseball, could, could consist of soccer, baseball, football, flag football, or softball. So if you're gonna uh, play in our green spaces, I'll use uh, Owens Field as an example. Uh, we know we have a lot of open green space, so we wanna minimize and practice social distancing if people are gonna out, be out there playing. Um, so that's phase two. Going into phase three, um, which is which will be on uh, June 8th, and I'm sorry, I did, I did not mention the tennis courts and the athletic fields will open up on May 25th. 
excuse me. Going into phase three, um, park amenities will open on June 8th, which means all park amenities will open. This includes, but it's not limited to basketball courts, uh, dog parks, skate parks, bicycle pump tracks, playgrounds, restroom, restrooms, water fountains, non circulating spray pads, and shelters. I think the key statement here is going to be our citizens uh, who participate in these activities do so at their own risk due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, we can't control when and where uh, things occur in terms of uh, someone who may contract this from using these amenities. So they do this at their own risk. We want to make sure we share that. That, that will take place uh, on June 8th, uh, all park amenities. Phase four, uh, which is recreational facilities, gyms, and wellness, will take place on June 22nd. Uh, one of the key notes here is our staff will, will train and transition starting on June 8th. Uh, through the 22nd. That'll be training on sanitation, disinfecting, social distancing, uh, as well as PPE. So we'll work together with our safety and risk management team to help facilitate some of that training. Of course, this comes with restrictions. Uh, these indoor spaces, such as our gyms and our facilities, must adhere to group size, capacity issues, and of course, proper, proper social distancing as well. Uh, maxim, maximum capacity uh, in the gym uh, will be, according to the CDC guidelines, uh, five persons per 1,000 square feet. Uh, that's including staff uh, to help with interaction and structured activity while exercising social distancing as well. Uh, this also includes citizens in any common areas, game room, craft room, reading, sitting area, and computer room must exercise social, social distancing. So all activities must be planned and implemented in compliance with social distancing. So we will monitor that very closely. And phase four, again, phase four will, will start on June 22nd. Going into phase five, tournaments and league play, we're looking at a proposed start date of August 3rd, uh, which is inclusive of youth and adult sports, outdoor organized league play, indoor organized league play, tennis courts league play and doubles. Um, indoor organized league play may be limited to coaches and players, officials, and administrative staff. And of course, we recommend that um, we take temperatures and attendance prior to the game. No spectators at that at the moment. Uh, this, this could actually change uh, over time. Uh, but the CDC recommends postponing um, or, or complete cancellation of organized activities and sports, mainly because these activities and sports require coaches and athletes who are not from the same household or living unit and must be in close uh, proximity. So, which could increase the potential exposure of COVID-19. So phase five, um, August 3rd, um, tournament and league play. And then going down to cancellation, we are making a decision to cancel uh, special events, summer camps, pools, and rentals uh, until further notice. Uh, I know there's been a lot of dialogue and discussion around pools. And on the DHEC website, they reference interim guidelines for pools. And according to the CDC, uh, of course, the virus that causes COVID-19 uh, cannot be spread to people through the water, the water in pools, hot tubs, spas, or water play areas. However, here's a key statement. However, the opportunity for transmitting the virus does exist in surrounding areas, which, which lies our concern. Person-to-person -person contact, hygiene concerns, exiting the water, Restrooms, lockers, and high, high touch point areas allow for increased exposure for youth and seniors. Uh, so for these reasons, I'm not in favor of opening Drew, the Drew Wilder Center Pool, Greenview, or Maxi Gregg uh, at this moment. Uh, if we were to, to pursue the opening of pools, the CDC has specific guidelines regarding cleaning and disinfecting. Of course, 20% of capacity expectation of the five people per 1,000 square feet. Um, so I want to give some, some insight on the, the rationale around, around pools at the moment. And then as far as in regards to summer camps, um, the CDC has made a decision or has a decision tool in place for youth programs and camps uh, and provides questions in that tool that um, organizations uh, could consider before coming back with summer camps. And the question they ask is, uh, will reopening be consistent with applicable state and local orders? Number two, uh, are you ready to protect children and employees at high risk for, for severe illness? And are you able to screen children and employees upon arrival for symptoms and history of exposure? And given uh, children will be children 
and that really puts um, uh, our, our youth, our, our seniors uh, that will typically bring their uh, children to camp at risk. And I'm, I'm, our team uh, is not um, in a position where we will recommend summer camps at this time. So those will be, have been suspended until uh, uh, further notice. And uh, additional measures that we will consider or implement is, of course, out of, out of an, an abundance of caution uh, for our seniors, we will, we're going to continue to provide exercise programming, uh, virtual programming relating to um, whether it be exercising and providing those tools for them to view on our city TV or a virtual platform so they can continue to exercise as they have done uh, in the past. Um, that is a very sensitive group, so we want to continue to to provide virtual programming for our seniors. And of course, as we come back online, equipment in all game rooms, day areas, gyms must be signed out by staff. Of course, equipment must be disinfected by staff before and after use. So those are these are standard guidelines that we will follow um, that have been recommended by CDC as well as DHEC, uh, whether that be um, advising citizens to wear their equipment um, before and after each use. Um, staff members have to take temperatures um, daily on arrival and departure, we already doing that. Um, staff must wear a mask at all facilities when they're interacting with courts and the public, so we'll implement those things. And of course, as I stated, expand our social media options and virtual programming where appropriate for, for youth and, uh, and seniors. Uh, some citizen guidelines that we want to share. Uh, we want to encourage uh, our citizens to wear masks when interacting with our City of Columbia Parks and Recreation staff. Of course, we maintain social distancing of six feet at all times. Uh, citizen visitation to park facilities will be limited based on our ability to maintain social distancing requirements. And also, the governor's order regarding gatherings um, is still in place re regarding gatherings of people in groups of three or more is prohibited. So um, park staff reserves the right to disband gatherings and or solicit support from our local law enforcement is needed to, to, to help with that. My final note is uh, we have some citizens who have uh, paid their and membership, um, for, for, for example, at our Jewel Wellness, Wellness Center, as an example, um, we will refund citizens um, for the months that they missed. I think there's been some concern about um, payment without being able to um, utilize our facility. So we will ensure that those, those people will, will be refunded. Um, so all of our resources uh, will be researched. Uh, of course, CDC, um, South Carolina Hospital, hospital um, Osaka, the Department of Health and Environmental Control, uh, South Carolina Recreation Parks and Rec Association, and the National Rec uh, Recreation and Park Association are, are some of the areas that we research and kind of um, look at data to provide this reopening plan um, for you all. And I know that was pretty quick and high level, and I apologize for that, but I know we are um, on a time schedule, so I'll turn it back over to Ms. Wilson for, for discussion. Quick and high level is appreciated, Henry. Uh, everyone, let's do quick and high level uh, throughout the day. Uh, mm -hmm. um, um, Madam City Manager, I know I'm sure there's probably more than enough uh, questions. Uh, yes, um, yes, sir. We can answer any questions you may have. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Duval, uh, I've got a couple of questions for Henry. Henry, I want to join Mr. Rickman's request that tennis be open, and then you've got singles tennis but you don't allow doubles tennis uh doubles tennis is what's what a lot of us especially older people have to play we can't cover that whole court by ourselves and uh i think we need to at least let you have a doubles match a uh, tennis that's only one extra person uh, well actually two extra people uh if three is the people the number of people that you're normally allowed to have in a in the congregate group, uh, this is just four people, and they're on both sides of the of the net. So I don't think having a doubles match would would increase the uh, danger of COVID nineteen. Well, I've got one other question. If you well, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, the other question is: uh, I, I note that uh, pickleball is the uh, number one growing sport in the United States, and I didn't see where the many Pickleball, um, pickleball courts that we have in the capital city of South Carolina would be open. Uh, could you tell me when you're going to open up the pickleball courts? Are you, 
are you referring to disc golf or what are you referring to? I'm talking about pickleball. For, for everyone else who's uh, who's on Google right now, <laughs> pickleball is a paddle ball sport that combines elements of tennis, badminton, and table tennis. It's Howard's Jam. Two, two or four players use solid paddles made of wood or composite materials to hit a perforated polymer ball uh, with 26 to 40 round holes over a net. Very interesting, <laughs> Howard. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, I wasn't sure if that was a, if that was a real question or not, but I, I assume it is. Well, the, the, it was a real question, but uh, I knew the answer was, was no because we don't have any of those courts. Yeah, we and we yeah. need to have some. There it is. <laughs> it's gonna be a long day. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> tennis and, and, and pickleball, Ms. Devine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Simons, and I apologize. The firemen rang my doorbell. So I had to go at the very beginning of your presentation. So I don't know if you addressed the skate park. Um, I know in your initially there was, it was in a later phase and, but I, um, I, I asked you to look at that. We've been able to look at that to see whether or not, um, you know, what we're going to do as far as the skate park. And then secondly, um, I know that the, the parks facilities are not open. Um, but since we are allowing green space, there are some parks where we have the parking lots that are blocked off, um, particularly the one that's been brought to my attention is Owens Field. Um, and are we able to at least open those so that people can park, even though we're not encouraging them to congregate, but so that if people want to walk, use the green space, do the walking trail, that they have a place to park when that's not on the street. So, um First, first question uh, for the skate parks, I think you referred that that'll be open in phase three. And then secondly, with the opening of the green spaces uh, and open spaces in, uh, in, in uh, last week, uh, on, well, actually on May 12th, the gates were open as well. So, so those, so participants are able to get into the green spaces now uh, to enjoy, enjoy the uh, greenways and, as well as open spaces. Okay, can you check the, the parking lot at Owens Field? My understanding today it's actually locked so that people couldn't park, they've had to park on the street to utilize green space. Absolutely, I know Randy Davis is on the line and we can definitely check on that, but yes, they are they are supposed to be open so folks can drive in and enjoy the green spaces. And then just not for Mr. Simon, just for my colleagues, you know, I know that we're all fielding a lot of questions regarding our parks facilities and amenities. And, you know, I, I think, the thing and the mayor's reminded us of this before, but I think we've got to keep in account that, you know, regardless of what the state has done, our state still hasn't seen the 14 day sustained decrease. And so, you know, we need to make sure that we are thoughtful. And I think our staff is clearly being thoughtful in the way we're phasing in stuff. Um, but, you know, my huge concern along all of this has been the missed mes messages to go as far as, you know, well, gyms are opening up. Why can't you open this up? And I think that we have to allow our staff and, and professionals, we can give them our feedback, but we need to allow them the ability to know what we're able to do, especially when it, uh, it involves putting our staff who will work at these facilities um, in direct contact with citizens on a regular basis. So I thank uh, Henry, you and Teresa and everybody for everything that you guys are doing. And although I ask questions, I'm just asking questions. I'm not pushing back. I think that you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. And, I, and I'll add, thank you for, for sharing. And I'll add that if you notice that in our phase, in our phases, uh, we're doing a minimum of 14 days in between so we can evaluate um, the client, hopefully in cases as we move from one phase to another. So thank so, you for so, sharing that. So I'm going to Mr. Davis and Mr. Uh, Brennan, uh, you got to unmute Sam. So Henry, I guess it is important to note for everyone who's listening and paying attention, people who may have to depart, that this is very much a living document and that we will be tracking data and tracking health and, and everything else. And, and uh, we, we maintain the ability to, to exercise the latitude to make more informed decisions as things go along. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Mr. Davis, uh, you still on mute, Sam, and Mr. Brennan. You're still on mute, Sam. Mr. Still got you on mute, brother. Henry. There you go. Yes. Um, I, I, I agree. I agree with uh, Mr. Vine's uh, uh, statement as far as um, you guys doing what you need to do. And 
And um, what I'm telling folks also is that we're, we're going by guide. We have guidelines, whether it's CDC or um, what we need to be doing as far as a, a, a city in trying to keep everybody safe. One question, what about the driving range? Is that accessible, is it open? That, that will be a part of the amenities. So on June 8th, that will be open as well. And I don't think I list that in my document, but yes, that will be open okay. in phase three as well. Yes. And okay. as, we, as we market this document, Henry, once um, you know we have full endorsement to, from council, as the mayor said, is living and breathing, but we probably need to list something like the, the golf range or go back and make some adjustments. Um, want to come back around to tennis doubles too. I don't know if we, um, and pickleball, if we got an answer to, to those and some of the rationale. And so, um, I'm getting some texts from staff too, reminding us that nationally, there's been some articles about with tennis, that the handling of the balls and that folks are sharing the balls and passing off germs that way. But again, we also recognize that at some point, you know, common sense has to kick in too with some of this with the public and how, um, you know, behaviors are. Again, it's it's a hard balance in that. So we're just trying to slow walk it, but at the same time recognize that citizens, um, you know, have to have some personal responsibility as well. All right, um, thank you, Mr. Brennan. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I wanna thank Henry and Randy. Y'all have been uh, wonderful, uh, very, very uh, reactive to uh, when we reach out to you for, for all issues, Parks and Rec. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to ask you from your U.S. Mayor's informa informative session you had, specifically, did they mention amenities like uh, dog park, skate park? Uh, and then also, y'all have data. You know who uses uh, these these uh, amenities at our parks. Do you think social social distancing could be uh, allowed? At, and obviously, common sense goes a long way for for folks to use these uh, in an earlier phase uh, than what you have projected out. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that, Henry. Um, th thank you for sharing that. Um, they they um, did specifically get into dog parks per se. Um, they did um, speak uh, around focusing on how the COVID-19 has impacted your area and begin to make decisions based on uh, the number of cases in, in, in certain areas. So they, they really uh, focus on giving some, some standard information, but also kind of putting it back on the local body, um, whether that be a DHEC or whether that be local government and or state for, for, for that matter, uh, to make decisions uh, around that. I think there's certainly some possibility to make some adjustments relating to dog parks if that's the way we want to. to, to right. To. I, and I, I want to comment. I, I think you have in phase three, the, the, the lined Senate citizens who participate in these activities do so at their own risk due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think that is wonderful messaging that uh, we should continue in all phases and, and to, to ring true that common sense will, will help us out of this much quicker. Um, I, I would I would really like staff to consider the uh, skate park and dog parks um, to be moved up into this phase two, um, and and would like to hear other discussion from my fellow council members on that. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, well, with, with, I want to talk about that too, uh, Mr. Rickman. I think you're on mute, Daniel. I just wanted to reiterate. I'd like us to consider moving skate parks, uh, the bike and, and dog parks and other things to phase two. Um, the, these, I've gotten more calls from parents, uh, kids, you know, individual schools. Um, we've got several people from uh, other areas calling about the dog parks. I just, I, I feel like that is something that we need to move to phase two. Uh, we don't need to allow people to take advantage of that, um, uh, those amenities. That, if, in an earlier date. Thank you. A um, couple of uh, quick thoughts. I'd, I'd like to first reiterate the um, uh, the admonition of, of the city manager, uh, along with staff, is that um, we have to recognize that while certain sports are obviously 
um, uh, easier to, to, to see that type of contact that we all want to continue to discourage that probably every sport, literally, including pickleball, however, wherever pickleball is, uh, we'll, we'll see the type of, of contact that we're still trying to make sure that we discourage, we want to make sure we send the, um, the, the, the right messages. I, I think obviously if we're going to do uh, tennis and, and, and others, and um, I don't, I don't um, uh, play tennis, I'm not sure there's as much uh, distinction between singles and doubles play. Uh, I think I'd, I'd probably wind up with Mr. Duval on, on that point. And I have no um, concerns uh, with the amenities. I, I am curious, uh, Henry, about the um, about the spray pads vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a swimming pool, and, and if that's uh, something that we we want to encourage. But that's kind of a it's kind of a, a, a maybe a red herring out there. I, I do think that the investments that we're making uh, as it relates to businesses and signage and state and social distancing, we probably need to look at incorporating that into our parks as well. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the same uh, advice and counsel that we're talking about, personal responsibility and of, 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 the, of the risk, uh, maybe in some conversations with Teresa Knox and others, I think really making sure that that signage is very clear at, at all of our parks so people understand exactly where, where we are. If, in fact, some of our parks, especially those that might see high use or whatever is, is, uh, is well within the city's financial ability, particularly leveraging federal uh, or state funds, I think we, we should probably try and provide as much sanitizer to these big drums uh, when, when appropriate. I think it's a, it's a thought there. They're not, they're not inexpensive, and, and obviously you can't do them everywhere all the time, but these big drums of sanitizer is something we might want to, again, use to, um, uh, to encourage uh, constant sanitizing in addition to what I know staff is already being trained uh, to do as it relates to sanitizing and, and, and disinfecting. Uh, as well, well again, um, highlighting for citizens the, uh, the personal responsibility they want to have. Now, so I assume as well that throughout this document and everything else that we're, that we're doing, obviously, uh, globally, as relates to a city uh, government, everything is consistent with where we expect governor to be at that time. Because I assume right now we're still under the same three or more persons, uh, rule, right? right? So, so we, so does that mean that we're expecting that by, you know, June, whatever, you know, June, June twenty second, or or what have you, to see some some softening in, in, uh, in, in because I assume without without that structural um, uh, ability to go uh, beyond that, that we that our our activity is going to be limited to some degree too. Is, is that right there or wrong? There, I don't mind being wrong. I'm just trying to make sure that that whatever we're doing is consistent. Uh, with, the, with the boundaries articulated by the government? I don't know, and Teresa Knox and Henry will have to help me with this, but I don't know that there are many other boundaries on state recreational um, amenities or facilities other than the congregating yeah. three or yeah. less. And that's the only one I'm talking about. Uh, so, so, uh, I, so can we encourage sports that exceed that 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 uh, um, per person limitation, and I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah. Well, I think it's with lots of things have been there. It's kind of um, counterintuitive the way the language is. <laughs> so it's saying <laughs> it's open, but then that language about the three or less is still there too. So I don't. I think we have we have tried to take the approach of what as a local government, the city of Columbia, what's safest from our perspective, but. If it's, a, uh, it, it's, it's, it's so important for us at this time to be thoughtful and judicious, responsive to the questions of our, of our, our citizens or the very same time keeping our eyes on, on public health um, as our priority. And I think it's also important that we, at the best we can, in the con the four corners of, of the of the latest executive orders, let's make sure that we're consistent with those. So let's just let's just. I, I think this is great, and I think I love the fact it's a living document, and and I think um, you know we're probably uh, you know well prepared. You know, citizens at some point are going to have to make as they're doing uh, every day in the street right now, make their own uh, decisions. I appreciate uh, 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 Teresa, you and your team obviously thinking about this and the various constructs you, you want to make sure that we're providing for the public protecting the public but also got your eyes on the prize of keeping your, your employees 
healthy and, and, and strong. And I think we, we, we just got to make sure, I, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're being very thoughtful and deliberative, but let's, let's be very specific that if, if in fact the governor's executive order, because right, it, it may require a conversation or a letter or some type of clarification that we may ask from him and, and his counsel, uh, what do you anticipate uh, in, in this space or how would you expect us to handle this uh, as, as opposed to us going alone uh, in, in, in a way that might be inconsistent with that order? So just and we, we certainly will do that, Mayor. I, to be honest with you, I think there's this continued reference back to the CDC guidelines and in this space, the parks um, guidelines, the National Association of Parks and others and those series of questions that we've asked ourselves and just combining that. And I think the governors, they refer back to that too. So I, what we've tried to do is follow that. And, and again, when it comes to some of these use of amenities and playing of sports that are not um, in the domain of our organized sports or camps, mm -hmm. that flexibility is there because as we phase it in because people have to use uh, their personal levels of responsibility and behavior and social distancing and all that where I think that line becomes finer is when we start talking about and bringing youth and seniors back into our facilities in an organized way where we then are liable and responsible even more so for how we interact with them how we um ensure that we our spaces are properly sanitized etc but definitely when it comes to dealing with children and listen that's a hard decision because parts and recreation city summer camp is a big deal and it always has been and it's done well but i would rather err on the side of not opening it because i just think there's some unknown still there when it comes to that these other phases we can probably get there and we certainly can look at moving up to phase two um, some of the areas y'all have asked for but we need to be clear about that probably today before we get off the phone sure sure and, and, let, and let me just add a quick comment so in phase three uh mayor we were um thinking that the executive order would would still be in place mm -hmm. so the expectation around dog parks skate parks uh, the pump track, playgrounds, et cetera, they still would have to uh, be confined to, to that order. So that's what we were thinking, even when we are looking at, at phase three. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, any other questions for, for, for Henry? So as we stand right now, the, the plan is to, is to move forward with um, uh, phase two, and the rest of his living document. Uh, would you mind speaking directly to Mr. Duval's question about, about single play and doubles play? So the, the thought process with um, singles play is kind of going back to our conversation uh, with the panel, with the U.S. Governor's, uh, 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 U.S. Uh, Mayor's Association. Uh, one of the things that uh, we discuss is, you know, transitioning from singles to doubles Unfortunately, when you have public play at a tennis court and you have doubles on the court, that also brings children and other folks to the actual tennis court as well, which you get you get into more gatherings than anything. So the more people you have actually on the court, uh, it gets into uh, something that we don't want uh, at this particular time. I, I wanted to have a little bit more time to continue to assess that and maybe maybe look at that in the next phase because you know I'm I'm here at Oldwood, my office is at Oldwood, and I see it for myself. You know I have people at, at times or pre previous to to COVID nineteen that partake uh, in in tennis, and when you have doubles on the court, you have folks on both sides, and then you also have their families mm -hmm. uh, at, at times that are involved, and then uh, then visitors are, are here, so it get, really gets into increasing increasing the numbers of citizens on our tennis court which increases the number of, or the potential of the, the, the virus to be spread from one person to another. What's the thought process regarding uh, the doubles play? And, um, and when is our next meeting, uh, Teresa and Erica? Because obviously the next question I want to make sure we, we close the loop on was the uh, request about some of the park amenities moving up, whether they're in phase two or at least at some point between 
May 25th and June 8th. Uh, is 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 there is there some time for us to get, come back in and reassess? Because I understand Henry's uh, uh, and, and team wanting to kind of just kind of see how things go in a, in a thoughtful, gradual manner. Um, I, I I can't tell you the difference between you know uh, interaction and, and on, a, on a tennis court, athletics field, you know, vis-a-vis -vis you know dog park or skate park. They, they seem to be maybe even a little less in, invasive, but I don't have to monitor them and, 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 and sanitize them and, and, and keep my eyes on, 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 on citizens uh, to, to help them protect themselves. Um, do we have another, when, when's our next meeting? June 2nd. June 2nd. Yes. Okay. Right. So, Mr. Mayor, did, did we want to discuss the, um, the feeling on the dog parks and the skate park or? Yeah, well, well, Will, Will, Will and, and Daniel mentioned different uh, park amenities as something uh, the potentially move up into phase two. And yeah, so if you got some thoughts on that, yeah, I think it'd be worth, worth hearing. I just, just for the record, I, 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 that's why I asked Henry about the skate parks. I forgot to mention dog parks. I, those two, honestly, to me are, are less, um, you're probably less um, congregating than you are in tennis. So, I mean, that's my thought is that, especially with dogs, I think naturally most people with dogs don't want to get near another person with a dog because the dogs tend to play or sometimes fight. So if there is a, you know, and we, in those two amenities, we don't have staff actually manning those. So they're not going to be really in, interacting with the public. So if there is a way that you feel like that could be moved up, I would be supportive of that. Mm -hmm. There's no one more more of a, a gentleman in City Hall than Henry Simons, so 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 y'all 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 make this. These are the times when if you got some special concerns, y'all need to make sure you push back against us. I also naturally don't see any challenges specifically around those two dog parks and and, and, and maybe the skate park uh, any different than you would uh, uh, maybe uh, tennis, uh, but certainly dog park. Uh, but but again, you, you as you phase your 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 staff. Uh, back in and they have to make make things happen. I want to make sure we're very sensitive to those administrative needs. Um, any, any thoughts or, or, around, around that? And then I see Mr. Davis has his hand up too. Henry, do you all, you know, we've talked about a couple of things in relationship to the dog parks and I think, you know, as school gets out, the skate park will probably pick up. So um, what, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not pushing back mayor I think there's you know we're looking at it really globally and what you know how we tend to see the traffic pick up with with kids as well but Henry what do you think I, I think that uh, I, I just want us to be very sensitive uh, to where we are um, you know we had 130 cases uh, on last night um, that I saw in the news with the heck and six additional deaths and um, you know I don't want um, you know, something that we evaluate or do uh, to be the cause of uh, so just be sensitive to not, to not to rush this, but to, just to make sure that we are very intentional um, about what we're doing and how we're doing it. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to moving, as um, Mr. Vine stated, the dog park and potentially the skate park. Uh, up into into phase two. I'm not opposed to that, but with any of these any of these decisions, um, I just want us to be sensitive to to. It only takes one case, and I just want us to be sensitive to that. Thank, thank you, thank you, right. Mr. Rickon. I'm sorry, Mr. Davis first, then Mr. Rickon, and then we'll try uh, to we'll uh, try on this. I um, I, I don't have a real heartburn about the dog parks either. You know, I've, I've participated in a few activities that. Earlwood, but um, Henry, maybe we could, if, if you if we move them up and and uh, allow them, then maybe some uh, ad additional uh, precautions. Um, you know, folks tend they move around a lot. The animals move around a lot, um, and if you're paying attention to your animal, your dog. You don't. You really don't have that much time to get that close or interact because you tend to sometimes uh, create your own space. Uh, so I, 
if the, maybe we can add some some uh, pointers or precautions to our guidelines as we have them now. But as it's been said, we don't we don't own them, so it's just that they operate on our property. You know. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and we can we can certainly uh, look at um, recommending a limited number of people going inside. Okay. So there's, some, there's some opportunities there. Hey, Daniel, you get the next to last word. Uh, I just uh, I think we ought to try to move to, to the, those skate park and dog park and other things into phase two. I, you know, I understand Henry's concern, but at the same time, you know, there are, we're looking at the overall picture and and individual sports I and mean, then we got people biking we got people going to the store we got people going there i mean at some point socially distancing responsibility goes on the individual and and i do think there's you know a real need for it and you know i appreciate his sentiment but you know i think we ought to try to move that forward well, well um obviously we make the policy decisions and the staff but the problem is the staff has to carry it out to make sure they can be successful uh in, in the greater goal so uh, if, if it's, if it's uh, Teresa, so it looks like the direction is um, uh, we'll, we'll move dog parks and skate parks up into phase two. Yes. Uh, would you do, uh, do a deep dive? I, 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 I like the idea of, of course, encouraging as much science as possible. Uh -huh. uh, let's limit, let's limit um, certainly the number, particular, I'm, I'm thinking particularly about skate park. Make yeah. sure um, limit the number of kids um, uh, uh, at the skate park. And then, um, of course, we, we, we've allowed doubles play as well. And do a deep dive into, and then you and um, Harry and Demetrius and everyone have been looking at the, the cost of sanitizer and, of course, deploying them in, in city facilities. We can't do them in every part. There's massive drums. But let's give, let's give a little more, more thought to what we could provide, at least in these early stages, um, in, um, uh, in sanitizer uh, for, for folks to use uh, at these different locations. And, and again, a living document. We might be at a different reality by the time we get to June second, and, and we might, we might, we we reserve the right to do a, to do a complete double back, or or to or to accelerate. You know, I think I think those are decisions you make uh, with good data and, and good information. And um, yes, sir. We'll see. But let's 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 wrap that up. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll open up doubles play as well in phase two and move. Skate parks and dog parks up into Mr. Yeah, McDowell's hand too, but your your mute's still on, Ed. Ed, your mute's still on, Ed. Uh, just word, just want to give a word of thanks to Henry and the staff there for uh, at least bringing this to the table with some with some idea of a foreseeable future. Um, I also want to. I'm sort of like Henry at this point. I want to vent uh, a word of caution because it is continuing, the cases are continuing to mount. So I want to, while we are in this posture, we also want to also be cautious and, uh, and deliberate with our understanding of what's going on. So Henry, I want to thank you for that and thank you for your uh, thinking through this process with us. And of course, June 2nd, we can, of course, do a deeper dive into those kinds of issues. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, man. Uh, thank you. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's rock and roll. That was, on, that was only an hour. I think yeah. we're going to make progress. Well, we're going to pick up some time there, though, in some of the other um, updates. Next up is a resilient Columbia Economic Sustainability Plan update. And I do think Melissa will be brief. This is more to just um, give you all the latest numbers with all of the businesses that have been served through the loan, forgivable loan process. Ms. Melissa Lindler, the Office of Business Opportunities Director. Good afternoon, how's everybody doing? Hi, I will be, hello. I'm gonna be very brief. I've get, been given my orders by both Ms. Wilson and Erica. So <laughs> I certainly am not gonna keep you all long. I do wanna share, um, some of the progress we have actually allocated all of the 1.4 million that council has uh, put toward our small business stabilization forgivable loan program. Um, when I last uh, spoke with everyone, we actually had 220 awards. Uh, since then, because of the extra allocation of the 400,000, we're able to actually do an additional 103 uh, awards. So that's great. 
Um, they're very excited. And again, we again we want to recognize OBO staff for the commitment that they gave uh, to this project. Everybody had was all hands on deck. Economic development, finance, uh, specifically um, Jan, her group, business licensing, IT, and also our ACMs and Ms. Wilson for their leadership and getting this money out um, in a very quick way. Um, again, most of the funds, as you see, for this uh, award, they haven't changed. The percentages have not really changed. So I'm not going to go into each um, each finding and where we were. But again, District 2 um, received the majority of the funding at 48.3% of the 323 awards that were made. Um, District 3, 27.6%, and District 1 at 15.8%, and District 4 at 8.4%. In terms of the actual dollar awards uh, by district, um, again, District 2 at 50.3%. Of the $1.4 million that was allocated, uh, $703,850 actually was allocated to District 2, 26.1% um, to District 3, 17.1% to District 1, and District 4 at 6.5%. And again, the percentages really have not changed with the additional awards that we made. Uh, we did see some changes, but not a lot. Um, one thing that did stay prevalent uh, with the additional funds that were made available to this program, restaurants um, still came in at number one, along with um, our professional services, as well as retail and salon and barbershops. That was our highest. Um, most of the, the awards that were made, because of our focus on that group of, of that industry, um, we made we were able to make 55 awards of the 323 uh, awards that were made. 55 of those were actually to our um, salon and barber shops. And again, um, the diversity of businesses that actually were able to participate in this program has not changed from our initial presentation on April 21st. And again, the length of time the awardees were in business, more than 10 years was the highest number of award recipients. 44.6% um, of the businesses that received awards, most of them have been in business for 10 years or more. And in terms of the dollar amount made, the average award did change. Last time I presented, it was the average award amount was $4,000. It changed, it's $4,300. The award most frequent, frequently made uh, remained at $5,000, with most awards being made between the $2,001 to $4,000 range at 43.3%, and um, $5,001 to $8,000 range at 29.1%. This, uh, this really did not change. Of course, we saw more of our businesses prior to COVID those that reported having zero employees was 17, one employee was 50, um, and 21 or more was at 32. Two to five was the highest prior to COVID at 127. After COVID, we had 74 of our businesses that reported having zero employees. 21 or more employees went from 32 to nine, um, and two to five, it still was high. It was at 118. Prior to that, it was at 127. Number of awards made by association, it's still the disbursement still stays similar to what we reported last time. With 37.5% or 121 of those awarded were minority and minority veterans. 62, 19.2% were non-minority women. And 140 of the 323 at 43.3% were non-minority and non-minority veterans. Dollar amounts did not change either. Um, minority and minority veterans, um, it still remained at 43% with $595,100 going to that association. Uh, non-minority women, 17% or $234,750. Non-minority and non-minority veterans at 41% or $570,150. So as of yesterday, of the 323 award notifications that we've made, 315 recipients have actually submitted all of their paperwork and final budgets, totaling 1.4 million approximately. We have about eight 
awardees that are still outstanding, which means that they still have to submit the paperwork to us. What we are giving them is a time frame to submit that information to us. It was in their loan documents that was in on May 31st. So if we have not received that information by then, we do have other um, applicants that we can actually make awards to. So we will rescind those awards. We've given them a lot of notifications asking for their information. So if we do not hear from them, we will start to rescind and start to award um, others that are in need of funding. So again, thanks to finance, they have actually processed 290 checks thus far as of last Friday. How recipients are using the funds, it, again, it did not change much. Uh, with payroll costs at $410,908, or 29.4% of all loan recipients, a lot of them are using this money for payroll costs and for rent, um, business rent and lease, at $478,926, or 34.2%. Um, so those are, again, the highest numbers uh, in regards to how they were using the funds, even with a lot of them receiving PPP, um, it was still needed to cover some payroll costs. Again, and rent utilities was also a, a big one at $102,438, 7.3%. Um, I'm going to stop there, but what I do want to share with you, again, it's been very positive. The community, the businesses are very, very excited about what we were able to do to sustain them until federal assistance and other public funding was made available to them. Since we last met, um, we received notice last week that because of our past performance with how we've administered, administered our Economic Development Administration funding, our com uh, Commercial Revolving Loan Fund, a select number of applicants in the City of Columbia was one have received notice or an invitation to submit a non-competitive proposal for additional EDA funding to capitalize a new commercial revolving loan fund up to $2.6 million. Um, and on top of that, you may also uh, get additional 10%, which is another $260,000 for administering those funds. Those funds are part of the CARES Act. Um, and we have until June 12th to get that proposal in. It's at 100%. There's not a match requirement um, for the applicant. That's very, very good news for us. They're trying to get this money out as quick as, as, quick as possible. And um, we're excited about it. We're actually drafting the proposal as we speak. Um, so this will help us not only assist more of our small businesses, but do additional training, technical assistance, and some other administrative things that we can do to help um, and partner with other entities to provide and serve the needs of our business community as they transition into the reopening phase um, of COVID-19. So that's all that I have. Um, hopefully that was quick enough. I think I did it in a, about maybe five or six minutes, which is pretty good. Uh, no, that, that's <laughs> like, no that, that, was, that was very efficient well, use of time. <laughs> And thank you very much. Uh, that the EDA opportunity is very exciting. Look forward mm -hmm. to hear uh, more about that. Teresa, let's, let's aggressively pursue that and, uh, and continue to you know get get that money on the street into the hands of small businesses that can then uh, continue to uh, keep our economy uh, moving and humming. So that's good stuff. Yes, sir. Melissa, thank you so much. Um, all the time and energy you and all the team have put into this for our um, business owners. That they're, I know they're so appreciative because I hear it all the time. So thank you. With that, we will move into our fiscal year 2020, 2020, 21 budget workshop. A few items here, Mr. Mayor and Council, and as uh, we're transitioning um, Missy Coffin, of course, our budget and program management director will take us through a, the bigger budget discussion and where we where we left it with you. But we've got two items that um, we want to review on as we do normally this time of year. And as Clint Shealy, our assistant city manager for Columbia Water, um, prepares for these two presentations along with Mr. Robert Chambers, our favorite consultant from Black and Beach. Um, I wanted to acknowledge one of a very special member of Robert of Clint's team, Mr. Robert Anderson, 
who is, you know, particularly special to all of us, but Robert, and we will acknowledge this more properly, Mayor, when, when we're able to be together, but Robert has been named one of the American Public Works Association's 2020 top 10 public works leaders of the year. And it's so well-deserved. And mm -hmm. we've had several of our um, folks in the city get this award. I thought Robert probably already had gotten it, but it's so well-deserved. We're very proud of him. Amen. Amen. Absolutely, yeah. Robert. We appreciate you, man. All right. So we will acknowledge it further later. And with that, Clint, I'm going to turn it over for you for our Columbia Water Progress and updates and the water sewer rate study update. As council knows, we are not proposing a rate increase this year. And of course that, um, you know, is, is the right thing to do. We think that's, that's our recommendation. We certainly want to give council all the information for the implications um, for future years that will hopefully still sustain that. Mm -hmm. Clint? Still muted, Clint. They may be prepping the presentation slides as it's not showing he's muted on my end. Let's see, here we go. I'm sure I'm busy right now. <laughs> Okay. Hey, uh, good, a good afternoon, Mayor and Council, Ms. Wilson. Uh, can you hear us? We can. Thank you. Okay. All right. Apologize for the technical difficulties there. Um, Misty Kaufman is sharing her screen right now. She's going to give a few slides, Ms. Wilson, uh, about proposed budget, and then then I'll um, pull mine up, and we'll have Robert Chambers shortly thereafter. So I think Missy is is next up. Good afternoon. Hey, Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Clint. Um, today we are um, continuing updates on our abbreviated proposed budget process for the fiscal year 2020-2021. Um, we are still working through our um, budget and, and just keeping focus. I know we've, we're repeating a few things just to, to keep in front of everybody. Our goal for the proposed budget is to maintain our continuity of operations. We, of course, want to continue operate, uh, providing our excellent day-to-day -day services um, for our community and fulfilling the city's financial obligations. Um, those are the goals that are shaping the budget that we have um, that we've presented so far. Um, also wanting to remind everyone a little bit about what, what's driving our budget process. Um, so this screen, I'm sure, looks familiar. This information looks familiar, but what's driving our process right now is highlighting those revenue sources that are most expected to be impacted due to their consumer-driven behavior. Um, and continuing to focus on um, what's impacting the development of our budget for the general fund specifically and then our parking and special revenues. Today we're going to focus on just some revisions that we have made to our general fund budget and share some additional information that was requested by City Council with regards to those things that we think will be impacted in the coming year or that we have we are, um, um, made adjustments for with our budget in the coming year and as also some updates on our hospitality proposed budget. Just to remind everybody about our general fund sources of revenues that we foresee being impacted, the business license being a um, major portion of that, some user fees, and of course we have made some additional adjustments to the transfer from hospitality tax, uh, reducing that transfer, and then some other ones. Water and sewer, as you'll hear a little bit more about here in the coming um, um, discussions this afternoon, um, as far as water and sewer, we don't really envision any impact, much impact there other than um, monitoring our collection rates um, from our customers. So far, we are on course to meet budget. So first, we'll talk a little bit about the general fund um, proposed budget and about some of the revisions that we have made since our meeting last week. We do want to update you that the budget is in balance. Um, remind you that it's in balance as required by state law. The budget was, has been advertised for the June 2nd public hearing. Um, and that, um, again, just reminding everyone that we're shaping our budget or what we have proposed for this coming budget is using revenues um, from our FY18-19 actuals. Um, 
in comparison, the total budget for proposed for 2021 is 137 million, which is a reduction of 24.6 million from the current year. Um, a large portion of that reduction, 9 million of that is from the use of our capital lease program. And then also two another 6 million um, that was added to the budget um, in April from the um, transfer for money and sewer for our COVID-19 emergency response. Um, so those, those are those are two of the primary sources. Comparatively as well, our proposed budget is just a $4 million reduction from prior year actuals, which is what we're using as our base for this budget. Of course, we're not projecting any increases in millage rates or fees in the budget at this point in time. Um, since the budget we presented to the council last week, we have made an additional reduction in the transfer from hospitality tax. We'll talk a little bit further about as we go along. Um, that does change a little bit the budget that's been presented or proposed and um, uh, advertised. So we'll need to make those adjustments as we prepare for first and second reading. Um, and just a reminder again that we will um, we do anticipate amending the budget later in the year as we proceed through um, the next several months, hopefully with providing getting more information that would help us with our revenue projections um, as we um, monitor um, throughout the coming months. So the budget that was presented to you as far as our department so again, when I mentioned abbreviated, all we've demonstrated at this point for our general fund is just a lot of amount for our department. We will be working with our departments over the coming weeks to revise those budgets to meet the FY1819 actual um, or meet the budget that's been balanced and presented um, for, for the public hearing. Um, some of the things that we uh, um, have, have had to adjust um, in the coming year are things that we would have either uh, scaled back from the budget or those things that we would not be going forward with or um, um, considering them temporarily suspended um, to get us through the next year as we um, encounter uh, and figure out what's happening with, our, with all of our revenue streams. But then also two, um, looking at those things that we might have to or, or just temporarily postpone. Um, City Council had asked for some of what those included and, and we presented, presented a list um, that's presented now. Um, we are anticipating that we will um, suspend the security camera upgrade. If you recall, we have issued a, a, um, an RFP process and have gone through the RFP process for that. We'll suspend that for the time being um, until we have a better source of uh, understanding about revenue streams. Um, expansion on a commercial retention program. That's not the entire program, but um, extension of possibly the some of the grants or other aspects of that that are no cost that will continue to proceed. Uh, whole, um, extension of the quarter master plan um, program. Bridge to work, that may not be familiar with most folks, but that was the program for um, employment of um, a partnership for home, for partners for homeless um, um, partnership work program for homeless employees. Um, with the Finley Park rehabilitation, that would have been funded through a, a future bond issued on the hospitality tax. With that suspension, um, we would also um, suspend the rehabilitation program. Again, this is a suspension, a complete cancellation. We do envision being able to go forward and back to those plans um, as the economy improves. Reorganization of the development corporations um, will also be reflected in the coming several months. The other items that, were that we will suspend um, in these next few months will be the capital lease for our rolling stock. If you recall, the general fund we issue a capital lease funding mechanism for purchase of our replacement capital, um, in particular our, our um, general fund departments, which would include our public works, our police and fire, parks recreation. That's something that we will definitely want to revisit in, in, in the coming months as it's essential and critical that we stay, we get back onto that cycle. Um, we know that the further we go out, the more cost it adds to our operations, um, just being able to maintain a fleet that's due for replacement. Um, We've also suspended, I'm sorry. Ms. Henry, you're um, gonna work it, but before you leave this slide, I'm curious as the 
say the reorganization development corporation is that is that because it's labor intensive my guess is that someplace we would actually uh recognize some some savings uh while they'll be recognizing yeah they'll be recognizing some savings um so that will go forward but i think that there's some um expectations of what that will look like over the next few months it won't be it won't be july 1st okay. in the budget it it may it may not have been the best place to list it there, but under the items that were included as proposed, it's just going to be phased out differently, Mayor. Okay. Okay. We're moving forward with that one. Okay. All right. Sounds sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So capital improvement program for the general that's just the general fund, which that would be our city facilities, city buildings primarily. Um and of course extension of employee merit or cost of living and other operational costs, including non-essential travel and training. Um, we'll take advantage, of course, of virtual training opportunities um, and travel is suspended um, regardless. Mm -hmm. So that's just an example of some of the things that we have highlighted at this point that we envision. Um, we'll have to continue to go through the budget process with the department. So the next discussion point are items that we um, wanted to bring forward to council's attention as they will be um, coming up on your um, in, in, in the June time frame or June council meetings for approval of these continued services that would begin on the contracted services that would begin July 1st. Um, we make sure that we bring them forward so that you're familiar and aware that of what we are what we have in the budget for these items we're going to start with the richland various richland county services which includes the fifth circuit solicitor's office the fifth circuit public defender and then the alvin escalin detention center the solicitor's office um you can see that we've presented we demonstrated what we have uh funded in the current year um the proposed budget is still reflected at those amounts that we have not taken into account that um allocations for those requested increases at this time um, will need to make adjustments if city council is interested in um, or, or pursuing the requested increases the solicitor's office funds two assistant solicitors as well as a, a city b prosecutor there's a request for an additional city prosecutor um, in the coming year the fifth circuit solicitor, fifth circuit public defender as you recall we're, we're required by state proviso to fund those operations right now it funds two public defender positions as a request for one additional. Salvinus Glenn, we're not request, we're not suggesting or um, um, forecasting any increases in that cost. Um, we are tracking within budget um, for those services at this point. It's based on a per diem um, rate that um, has been into effect since um, last year. We're still, again, we're still tracking uh, within budget and do not forecast or increase for next year. Um, I want to put a pin in that. I do want to come back and discuss those at some point. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. For homeless services, um, there are four, four uh, contracts that the city has under our homeless services. We typically budget one million dollars for those homeless services there has been savings from some of those contracts in prior years that so we have allowed for some of those funds to be carried forward to amend for the preceding years um and so far we're still on track with that same process the inclement weather center is um, one contract the united way is the primary contractor and they sub out various services of those of for operations of the, the city Inclement Weather Center. While it's operated from November to April, um, the budget itself, the part of the staffing um, is for full year operations for outreach services. Um, it does reflect an increase of $55,000, almost 56,000 um, in their operations. Also on our homeless services contracts is our regional homeless coordinator. United Way is also the contracted agency for that services. The, that contract partially funds two of their staff positions. One is for outreach, one uh, assists with the uh, homeless youth program. This budget also helps support some of our travel assistance services and some of the HMIS 
um, which is the um, Homeless Management Information System reporting processes. This budget is a decrease of $30,000 requested for next year. So again, uh, uh, I want to underscore the point that homeless services proposed this budget are either stable or increased and in, in the aggregate increased. Uh, our spending on homelessness is going, will go up in the proposed year. Okay. So, um, the third contract for discussion is the transitions um, through Midland Housing Alliance. Uh, we fund primarily as an agreement with transitions since their existence for um, it assists with their security services, but also provides some funding for their par uh, partial and for their operation assistance. They have requested an increase of $10,000 in the coming year. And then finally, Housing First um, program, which is a national program. It's run through the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. Their supportive housing program provides supportive funding for the Housing First model, and no change in funding is requested for this fiscal year. Next, we'll talk about the hospitality tax budget. Um, uh, from what we presented to City Council last week, the budget, it's, the total budget is not changed. It's still a proposed budget of 7.1 million, which is a reduction of 4.1, almost 4.2 million from the current year. Um, of course, those revenues being impacted the most from the COVID-19 and impacts on the hospitality industry. Um, we have um, not made any changes to our debt service uh, since the last presentation, where we have made changes since the last discussion is we have reduced the transfer to the general fund um, by additional 1.1 million. So the transfer of the general fund is now proposed at 1.5 million with additional funds being made available for allocation um, by city council from, uh, for 2.5 million. I don't think there's any more discussions on that. Um, component, but um, otherwise part of what is impacting our um, revenue uh, pro projections is the fact that we are unable to, to determine if there's any settings at this point. Um, the request is carried forward from um, current year into the next year, uh, it's May 30th, that, is, that has been the process for the past several years. So we're not at that deadline yet to know which agencies will be requesting their uh, requesting carry forwards from May 30th. Um, we've also extended the deadline for collect for hospitality collections that typically do monthly. We've delayed those until June, um, and then we will we are prepared to ask additional information um, going forward um, as directed by the as we'll discuss today, possibly with City Council. And of course, we're continuing to monitor these revenues. And we will prepare to adjust the budget as we go forward um, in the next couple of months um, to see if there's any determination about the possibility of whether there's surplus from any savings or whether or not the revenues collected, whether revenues projected for this year are collected as Again, again, Missy, would you cover one more time uh, the, you, 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 you completely the, uh, the change in the last presentation as it relates to uh, uh, the, the Transition General Fund and- Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, um, originally we had used the train, we had, the transfer to the General Fund in years past has been $3.7 million. The initial proposed budget that we presented to City Council last week showed a reduction in that transfer of 925,000. Um, in working through the budget, we were able to make some additional reductions in the general fund in order and allowed us to reduce the transfer from the hospitality tax even further um, by 1.1 million, which made the new transfer to the general fund proposed at 1.5 million, which allowed us to increase the amount remaining for allocation by city council to 2.5 million. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I appreciate that, Teresa. I know that you talked to a number of us, uh, and the staff had, and uh, some of us expressed some grave concerns with the uh, rapid precipitous decrease uh, going to our arts organizations. Uh, I know we also talked about something that requires a much more 
uh, a deep dive into discussions uh, with our uh, uh, with our um, organizations. Uh, uh, obviously, the, the, what we're seeing the, the decrease certainly this uh, spring in, in in collections, and we're going to obviously everyone's going to have to uh, try to manage through that and and see a reduction in, in distributions. Uh, have have we? at least had discussion yet with some of our larger organizations, recipients of H tags, because uh, I'm curious to see how folks can potentially stage uh, some of the uh, events that, they're, that, that they were planning on, which uh, I think, obviously, I think if, if it's not an essential, essential event that, that defines your organization and certainly it helps you continue to build um, a revenue to do other things we do, we need to all be thinking kind of down the line how we could move some of these events maybe into next spring when things look more clear or what have you. But I think at least with, with the larger groups that, that consume the vast majority of, of, H, of H tax uh, funding, uh, I think it's uh, it's important we have those discussions. It's very much become a productive dialogue. I've got a few emails from some folks, and I, I appreciate the, uh, the insight I have, and I do appreciate staff going in the direction uh, that that this um, uh, that this uh, proposes. Uh, more money going to the arts organizations, and, and less being transferred to the general fund, but obviously. Uh, uh, I think that it's going to remain something we have to continue to um, digest and, and, and figure out how we, we, we make things happen. Have we had any chance yet to, to, to yes. speak with those organizations, or some of them? We um, are in the process, Mayor Benjamin, um, and Missy um, and Dee Dee are working through the Zoom's uh, grants portal to send, they've sent some questions out to the groups, a series of questions. I want to say those questions are due back to us by May 26th, okay. um, right after Memorial Day. But I, I do see a note also that carry for requests were due anyway by May 30th. So hopefully between, you know, the groups and some of the line item agencies really thinking about what is realistic and practical. Um, I'm hoping that we'll get, you know, some mm -hmm. honest answers on what they really think they can move forward and do uh, realistically considering what's going on. And hopefully that will help you all um, if we could bring that information back to you on June the 2nd. Well, we're 1.1 to the million to the better than we were last time. So that, that's a uh, good strong progress in the right direction. I would encourage, let's continue to, to do a deep dive there. And well, you know, I know that I, I, I had a chance to look at some of the Zoom analytics the other day. And then when we're having these important discussions, we see a, a real spike in the number of people viewing. I want to encourage all of our arts organizations that, who, who really provide the, the true cultural infrastructure of, of the city uh, to be encouraged, that we're being thoughtful and deliberative in this process that we're operating within. Obviously, the, probably the greatest um, uh, financial challenges, uh, some say since the Great the Depression here, uh, but we're being good stewards. And this is going to have to be some an, an, an example and some some real shared uh, responsibility, uh, aggressive actions to, to 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 mitigate the impact on our respective organizations and the uh, the the H tax. Uh, we're doing all we can to make sure that our uh, our, our private businesses that help generate H tax are have, have remained viable and strong during these difficult times. We're going to continue doing that, and hopefully we have. Uh, a much smaller delta to cover because of that, but it does require uh, some 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 real um, sweat equity from all of us to help us get to that. And so, those of you who've been sending some really thoughtful, constructive, uh, uh, keep sending them. Uh, we're we're going to do our very best to work with this uh, together. So, just wanted to kind of uh, uh, have that message. I'd be very interested in hearing. Uh, uh, I know council will as well. The discussion regarding. Uh, carry forwards as, as as well as the feedback we get uh, from our, our various organizations as we as we get closer and closer uh, to to meeting our statutory uh, obligation uh, to passing a balanced budget. So thank you. Yes, sir. And Missy, I don't, I hope I didn't misspeak, misspeak on any of those deadlines as far as those um, responses on the questions we put out. Mr. Mayor. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I I, I I had to scroll down and see who else had their hands up. Uh, Mr. Mr. Duval. Mr. Mayor, I've had uh, conversations with several of the larger groups, and I think that they are expecting a uh, shortfall of about 25% of their previous 
uh, allocations, and this will go a long way towards it being able to do that instead of the 60% uh, first proposed by staff. So I, I will uh, look at some, some numbers and see if we can uh, come up with some sort of allocations for them. All going, all going in the right direction. Uh, we, we got, we're going to end up right here somewhere in a way that makes sense for uh, for everyone, and but recognize obviously the, the reality. Oh, sorry. I, I'm sorry, guys. The way the screen set up, if anyone else said the hands up, if not, we, let's let Missy keep on going. Uh, go ahead, Missy. Thank you. So just um, to wrap up, our next step is you know, continuing to build on our budget. Uh, we will work towards the public hearing and first reading and monitor revenues as we continue to work with our department. Make sure we are prioritizing our programs and services and um, delivery of those services. Just to remind everybody, our budget schedule is that the um, budget was advertised in the paper yesterday, the public hearing. Our budget discussion today, first reading and public hearing is June the 2nd. Second reading and final adoption is June 16th. And did you want to revisit any of the other convers any other other you wanted to put a pin back in the conversations in the contracted services? Yeah, the um, yeah. What, what was it you referenced earlier? Oh, County it's, services? Yeah, it's only a couple hundred thousand dollars, but I do want to do a, a, a deeper dive in, into the solicitor's office and the, and the uh, I mean, every, we're we're in that in that uh, cycle where every 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 penny is going to count. Um, so. Um, uh, I'll, I'll probably have some feedback. Obviously, making sure that we're consistent with our. I think we're. I think even with the funding we currently have, we're consistent. With the state advisor it relates to the PD's office, and and I'll I'll, I'll share my thoughts with Solicitor Gibson and, and Chief Public Defender uh, Pringle as well. Uh, but um, I'm not I'm not necessarily yet sold that we need more 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 funding there. So that's that's one man's opinion right now. We we, we obviously have more. Uh, more time to discuss those. So, but thank you for, or, or thank you for the progress and the and the and the movement. And we'll have some more time to talk about uh, some of these other things later. Yes, sir. Missy, uh, just a, um, I guess, just point out um, under contract for services, um, under hospitality. I know we all look at the line items a little bit differently. Historic Columbia. Let's just make sure that we understand. I mean, in essence, we have a contract with them to manage our properties. It's a little bit different. I know we put everybody that we own their buildings, the museum, you know, senior resources, we look at those differently, but we actually have a contract for services on Historic Columbia. So make sure that when we think about um, the hospitality, I don't know where, where it's gonna flash out, that we have the true numbers on the cost to actual operate the buildings that we own as part of that contract. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, great, that's a valid, great and valid point. To make thank, 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 thank y'all. Thank um, Missy. Thank you and uh, Teresa. Good, good thank stuff. You. Good stuff. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. At this time, we'll move into the Columbia Water discussion. Good afternoon, um, Miss Wilson, Mayor and Council. Um, thank you for uh, just a, a few minutes to talk about. Um, Columbia Water, if you, a little progress we've got and some updates that we've got. Can, can y'all see uh, slides on on the screen yet? Not, not yet, Clip. Okay, Corey. Um, it's sharing, beginning to share now, I think. Okay. Okay. Very good, thank you. Um, so I appreciate y'all's time. I know that, that you got a lot of pressures and uh, for your time and attention right now. And we will, we will do our very best to be brief. Um, Robert Chambers will follow me with a little bit of an overview about our financial planning um, an update that we've been doing. But again, appreciate um, appreciate the chance to share a little bit. Um, so, if if you don't hear anything else I, I say today uh, in the brief presentation, a couple of key points to take away: um, we will continue our customer service focus um, that that we have have been focused on this year and um, that laser light focus will continue in every aspect of our operation. Um, we, we believe we're making good progress toward being a best in class utility. We're going to continue using technology and be very strategic in our hiring. Um, I for one believe we've 
We've, we've been very successful in, in hiring this past year, bringing on talented individuals like Tiffany Latimer, who helped lead our customer care team, Frank Eskridge, a deputy director of utilities that Joey's brought in, excellent job he's doing, and Robert Yannity leading our communications for Columbia Water. Um, really, really strong members of our team, and we're going to continue that forward progress as well. We hope our citizens are not um, realizing any impact in the services that we provide, but we are certainly seeing an impact from, from COVID-19, and we expect that that may slow some of our forward progress, but um, we will not regress. We will continue moving forward, maybe not quite as quickly on the capital spend, but we do plan to continue moving forward. And then finally, we're going to be communicating our progress through our website and social media and public meetings as we've been doing. Um, that may look a little different in this in this new age, um, but but we're going to continue trying to push our message out. So um, I'll move on. One of the first things we we um, wanted to talk about, and it's not a coincidence, is customer care. And um, I won't read the bullet items off, off the slide, but um, you see down at the bottom: transparency, accountability, and integrity core values of, of Columbia Water, those continue to be what drive us. And um, I just want to say that Tiffany is doing an outstanding job um, working with our staff um, and being responsive to our customers, um, even in the age of, of staggering call takers and having folks working from home. We've seen call wait times drop quite a bit. Um, we're seeing good motivation with our staff. We're using, um, we're answering phones remotely. We've got 10 call takers today answering phones from their home office and being very responsive and, and we're monitoring those metrics and that's been very successful. I did want to mention an upgrade to our, our phone system as one of our customer care initiatives that we've got. You're familiar with the My Columbia SP app that we launched last year. Um, the next phase of that is modernizing our, our customer care experience, um, providing online chat features, virtual hold callback features, wallboard monitoring, things that a modern call center has. And so we've looked at what does it mean to be best in class as a call center, and we have entered in contract to upgrade our facilities, and we expect that upgrade to be made um, by the end of this calendar year, hopefully um, late fall, early winter there. Again, calendar year. Um, some of that cost is being absorbed in this year's operating budget. So um, we're not asking for additional dollars to do that, but we think it's gonna be a huge enhancement for our customers and, and really modernize our call center. So uh, major kudos to Tiffany and the work that she and her staff are doing um, to serve our customers. I want to mention utility operations and some of the advancements that we're making there. We continue with our mapping of our water system. Um, we're about 15% complete. That is a multi-year assignment um, that a local surveyor is engaged helping us. Um, but we believe mapping and improve, improving our GIS um, are really, really important um, components to having a modern asset management system. Um, we are talking about mobile city works and continuing to roll that out, build on the success from wastewater maintenance and roll that out in our drinking water maintenance side. Um, actually, I believe uh, Councilman Duvall and Councilman Brennan are, are coming over to, to our Beltline facility in the large training room tomorrow. We're going to space out and they're going to get a little bit of hand, uh, um, first hand demonstration of what we're doing there. Everyone else is welcome. That's at, at 1030 tomorrow morning. Um, we, we also continuing to implement our apprenticeship program. Some of our training has slowed down because of COVID-19, um, but we are, are looking at that as an employee. Um, and we have several uh, contracts which y'all have approved for restoration or for um, repairing water leaks and, and others to come where we're, we're going to uh, be using local contractors to help us respond to our customer needs well, we may, when we may not have the staffing to be able to respond, so we're going to bring in outside services there. Very proud of our operations staff and the work that they are doing um, to, to continue providing services during this, um, this unprecedented time. So we'll move on and talk a little, really quickly about capital projects, the first being an AMI update. Um, we've got about a fifth of our customers um, that, that have been upgraded to AMI meters. 
Folks are starting to um, download the Island Water app. We are making outbound calls where we see continuous flow that is indicative of a leak and notifying customers the next day that they may have a leak rather than get them getting the shock of a high bill potentially 30 days later. So that is really working. Um, we are ramping up that installation. Um, we're, we're right on track. We've had to replace more meter boxes and backflow preventers than we anticipated. We've made some adjustments and are moving forward. Um, we've got five customers that have excited safety concerns and don't don't want the AMI meters, um, but we have a response prepared based on our conversations we've had with council and to be and prepared to send that out in the next few weeks. Um, 28 total refusals, but only five were based on safety concerns. Some others were schedule or potential landscaping concerns, those sorts of things. So we're working through those with our customers as best we can. All in all, very successful so far. Very, very pleased with the work that, that the contractor is doing for us, Badger Meter and, and our staff are doing. The map of the release just shows the, the um, variety of the different areas that we are touching. We're touching the system as a whole and, and are now starting to come back in and backfill based on meter reading routes. Um, we're also our the manual red meter skips. The skip numbers are going down. The estimated read numbers are going down for the 120,000 or so meters that we're still reading manually. We're able to keep up, um, and that is that process is improving as well as we install more AMI meters and it relieves some of that pressure to get those reads and get them quickly. Uh, if you, uh, I wanted to highlight a few capital projects on the water side, our canal water plan improvements. We had something on council agenda last time that y'all approved. Very, very important project is, is moving along nicely. Um, and we're very pleased. If you've been down to Riverfront Park, you've seen some of that from a distance. There's, there's a lot of heavy equipment and cranes working down there right now, but the contractor has been, been moving along and making good progress. We have um, two large projects coming up um, for water distribution system that are very important for um, both supplying Pinewood Industrial Park and helping us move water out to the northeast. Um, utility relocation is very, very busy right now. DOT is keeping us really busy. Um, they've got some, some dollars and, and they are taking advantage of that and, um, and are moving forward with a lot of projects that's keeping us very busy. And finally, water quality continues to be a big focus. We've completed two projects. We've got a lot of water quality projects in the queue as well coming up. Um, Earl Wood's about to be wrapped up. That was about a $6 million investment. Um, the others on the list are, are either in some form of construction or Trenum Road is about to start construction. Um, that has already been approved. Um, we do have some upcoming projects, Rosewood and Shandon entering the design phase. We will only be able to do the design during this coming fiscal year. Um, we had met with the constituents in the Rosewood area and had mentioned that we had hoped to be in construction this fiscal year. Um, from a funding standpoint, we're going to be in design. That doesn't mean delaying construction 12 months. It probably delays construction two or three months um, from when we could bid the project. So it's not a full year's delay based on funding, but a, a slight schedule impact there. Some of these other smaller projects, we're, we're poised to proceed with, with those and address those within our, our available funding. So moving on quickly to wastewater. Um, some of y'all have toured the Lake Catherine uh, Gravity Sewer Project and seen the um, enormity of that project and, and, and really um, there's a lot of activity happening in folks' backyards there, but uh, contractors doing a good job for us. The community has been amazing and, um, and very uh, receptive and, and understanding based on some schedule delays due to um, unprecedented rainfall. But that project is moving along nice and really going to help us get our SSO numbers down even further. Each Rocky Branch Phase 2, very important project for us to protect the downtown area from capacity limitations. We did that project last week at a, a number that came in on budget. Very excited about that. You'll be seeing that project um, come before you for a construction award um, next month. Um, a lot of big projects happening at the Metro Wastewater Treatment Plant. The, the two really large ones, digester improvements and train one aeration improvements, are coming close to completion. And just want to um, all of our facilities, our treatment plants, both water treatment plants and our wastewater treatment plant staff have done a fantastic job. Uninterrupted service 
staggered staffing were necessary, really good plans in place, and really proud of them for the work that they're doing. Um, uh, just a, a quick shot of some of the uh, impressive work that's going on around Lake Catherine right now. Um, they're meeting with Ben Brantley, the Homeowners Association president, on Friday morning to talk about a few of his concerns, but we, we stay in constant dialogue with those folks and trying to be um, receptive to their concerns as, um, as this major project is happening right in their backyard. We want to highlight just a few stormwater projects very quickly. Um, we continue to move forward with our, our green bond expenditures. Um, a couple major projects completed in LK Park is really, really nice. If you've been out there, Wallace Street and Devil's Ditch have come to completion. Um, Harlem Heights is on your agenda for this evening, about a $6.6 .6 million investment that we're excited about, and several others that are pending or either in progress. You can see the Rocky Branch outfall repair photo there. So we're continuing to move forward with our our stormwater projects. Uh, well, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about our consent decree and the Clean Water 2020 program. So just a couple of quick slides there. Um, we're making very good progress. 16 of 19 submittals are complete. We remain on schedule um, and are, are finishing, actually finishing things a little ahead of schedule. Usually we're submitting right on schedule. The, um, we have petitioned the EPA and Department of Justice um, raising our hand to exercise the force majeure clause in our consent decree due to COVID-19. We have had conversations um, with EPA. Uh, they're awaiting uh, information, a uh, summary of information as to how we were impacted and how we are being impacted. And so we're evaluating that, but we did need to go ahead um, as soon as we knew and raise that um, raise our hand on that. And so they're expecting us to come with some potential delays and, and request some extensions and uh, with some proof behind that, whether it be consultant limitations due to COVID-19, contractor limitations, or our own staff limitations, potential revenue impacts. So we're putting that together. Um, we're working on a hydraulic model recalibration effort. Um, as you know, we had a very wet winter. Um, as we're hydro uh, recalibrating our hydraulic model, the, those revised results could lead to a few areas of capacity limitation. Um, we're trying to prioritize our efforts moving forward so we can minimize, if not eliminate, those capacity limitations. And um, we're working very closely with that. Part of our negotiations with EPA will center around potential extensions based on what we're seeing with our wet weather hydraulic model recalibration. Finally, our infrastructure rehabilitation report was, um, was submitted Lake Catherine is one of our early projects that's nearing completion that, that, that has a deadline. We've got several other lists of projects. So some of the things that we're not able to fund this coming year don't go away when those deadlines become a little bit tighter. We still believe we, we have enough time to execute the projects and, um, and to honor our commitments, um, even with a reduced CIP for this coming year. Uh, that's just a list of our, uh, our deliverables. Um, and those programs will again, again continue moving on for years to come. Um, the impact of a reduced CIP and, and uh, potential, uh, what the COVID-19 may mean for us uh, as, an, as a utility is that we may be in the consent decree just a little while longer than we had anticipated. So again, moving forward, it may slow our progress slightly. Be remiss if we didn't show a summary of our sanitary sewer overflow information. Um, the, uh, the far right hand side of, of the graph is our calendar year for 2020. 412,000 gallons, almost matching calendar year 2019. And that occurring during uh, the, the wettest, one of the wettest winters in history. So I'm really proud of the efforts that our staff made to minimize sanitary sewer overflows. That's still too much. We don't think that is acceptable by any means, but um, we are making progress. The million gallon red bar that you see um, during this very wet winter, we experienced the fifth high, highest Congaree River level in recorded history. When that occurred, the river actually backed up into our outfall pipe and flooded our disinfection contact basin within our treatment plant. So the river was coming back on us. Um, 
the wastewater was fully treated through all the treatment process processes, including disinfection, but because the contact chamber was flooded, it was counted as a, a partially treated release of wastewater. We're very confident, no environmental impact. We made the necessary public notification. Um, it's not a, a sanitary sewer overflow, but it is a release of partially treated wastewater that we do have to report. So that's why you see that. And again, it was tied to river level. Our focus has been on addressing sanitary sewer overflows of raw untreated wastewater in the collection system. This episode occurs maybe once every 10 years with that, that high river level and backing up into a treatment plant. But again, we're managing risk and, and, and assessing where to spend the dollars. We think it's much wiser to, to protect the environment and public health from raw untreated wastewater spills versus things that uh, a flow that's been through our entire treatment process and just do a little bit of flooding there. So um, that has been somewhat intentional in terms of how we're prioritizing how we address those issues. Finally, our capital improvement program, um, we're proposing a $40 million capital improvement program combined water and wastewater CIP for this year and no rate increase as Ms. Wilson and me have alluded to. Um, that is quite a reduction from what we had originally planned for, but we're putting a lot of effort into designing projects and having them ready. And also, you're going to see a lot of capital projects continue coming before you based on funding that was previously approved in, in, in another fiscal year, and we're executing those projects and sending those to construction. So we're still going to be very active, still managing um, quite a bit, tens of millions of dollars of capital projects um, above and beyond this 40 that is new money that we're spending. I'll point out the alternate raw water pump station at the canal water treatment plant. Um, very important that we move forward with design there for those improvements, um, continue investing in water quality projects citywide on the wastewater side, um, continuing with some major rehabilitation and lining up capacity improvement projects that will allow us to move right into construction next year and potentially um, avoid or or minimize any capacity limitations based on our modeling and our negotiations with EPA. So um, a lot of projects in the queue, still very, very busy, not quite the spend that, that maybe you're used to seeing. Finally, I wanted to mention um, just a, a little bit about the consultant selections. We've been focusing, um, sending out general requests for state, uh, statements of qualifications for We've done this for wastewater projects. We're now doing it for water projects and utility relocation projects that allow us to be nimble and responsive. As needs come up, we can make assignments, um, review proposals, and, and get awards made. But we categorize them working with our, our folks in procurement who have been great during the working from home and COVID-19. They've really stepped up and kept us going. Um, and kept the contracts moving. I call to your attention, protege only water distribution projects. We've got a few of those. We're looking to move towards some protege only construction projects as well, trying to help drive the local economy and help our protege firms. And then finally, just a quick listing of our stormwater CIP. Um, I think you've heard before that we're looking to defer our stepwise rate increase for stormwater fees as well. So we're hold those, planning to hold those steady pending your approval for one year and then move back and continue with our forward progress. But we've got a lot of folks working, a lot of consultants on, and projects under design now, looking at moving about $20 million worth of work this coming year with our stormwater funding, even without that rate increase. So um, continuing that, that impressive progress that, that Dana Higgins and her group are doing um, with our stormwater program. So with that, um, apologize for the speed, but wanted to kind of get through that as quick as we could. I'll, I'll answer any questions that you might have and then turn it over for Robert Chambers to share. No need to apologize for the speed. It's appreciated. All right. Uh, it's, uh, I don't, uh, Mr. Davis has his hand up. Mr. Davis? Yeah. Can't hear you, Cowboy. You covered a lot of territory, Clint. Um, I was uh, pleased to see a number of projects uh, that's that's uh, 
that's underway now, not necessarily in, in any particular area, but um, I think that says something about where the dollars are really going and our commitment to um, you know, cover all of our requirements. One thing that caught my eye, uh, the um, apprenticeship program. Um, are we getting, how, how was that going? I've uh, had some people that, uh, uh, some high school kids really, just kind of interested in doing some of that. But also, um, are we viewing that also as an opportunity to um, uh, maybe uh, groom some smaller business folks also to um, uh, maybe put them on the track to um, um, contracting with us or really having some solid strengths going into the you mentioned protege program so, so thank you councilman great questions and um, i'll address that in two parts the the apprenticeship program is geared toward recruitment and retention and so you speak of high school students and um, we have entry-level positions where we are thirsty to get um, young folks coming in and introduce them to our profession and train them and equip them and help them advance in, and build a career with us. So that is the goal of the apprenticeship program. And if you've got some names, I, I'm all ears. So I, please send them to me. We'd love to, to, to continue building our team with younger folks as well as, as keeping our folks that have experience. And we equip them with training and licensure and CDL licenses and, and the treatment licenses so that that is the goal um, from a contracting perspective um, that's not as much the apprenticeship program as it is working with uh, melissa and, and, and her staff to um, develop more protege capacity um, and, and provide opportunities for smaller projects to to um, get more folks playing in the space that that um, the water and sewer contracting environment so that is something as we look at, at both protege design firms and establishing protege only, but also some of the bids that we've been putting out have been protege only. And um, so we're looking to do that as well. I think it's really important that we we try to, to grow our local base. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see us really focus on that. I, you know, you can continue to look at, at the contract, even some on uh, tonight's agenda. It's a lot of dollars still leaving the area. Um, so I think that may or may not have anything to do with, with the skills that are here, but I, I, I'd like to see us as a city um, do what we can to also um, keep some of those dollars in the community. Uh, there's a lot of them still going down the interstate, if you know what I mean. Yes, sir, I do. I sure do. Yes, okay. Sir. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Clint? All right. Let's keep it moving. Thank, thank you, Mayor. We appreciate that. And I, you know, I just want to thank our staff for, for what um, they've been doing for us um, and for our, our citizens. And um, we'll move on to, to Robert Chambers. Robert's got a few slides to share, and um, he'll be sharing his screen here shortly. And um, I, I just want to say that we really appreciate the work that Robert and Black and Beach have done to help us develop. A, a robust financial plan and that's what he's going to be speaking to is, is our financial plan and um, because we've got a, a solid financial plan it allows us to make adjustments like we need to and it's really beneficial to to look at our rates each year and our expenditures and revenues each year and we're just grateful that y'all um, continue allowing us to do that and grateful to Robert for, um, for providing those services for us so Robert I'm gonna turn it over to you Thank you very much, Clint. Um, are you all able to hear me and see uh, my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, City Manager, thank you all for, again, giving us the opportunity and the privilege to be here to present. Uh, what we'll do today, you've, you've seen, um, you know, the, the, the basis of this presentation, and it's just us going about continuing to walk the path um, that we've been walking given the current situation uh, that we're, we're, we're facing 
as a community. Uh, the agenda, we'll go over a few purpose, your purpose, drivers, assumptions, and then try to hit the basis of the financial plan and then close looking at some billing packs. So the purpose, why we're here, we're, we're here to perform this independent study. In essence, what, what that means, we're trying to first of all understand what it takes to operate the utility and what revenues are required to operate the utility on an annual basis. We also go about looking at the cost to serve each of the customer classes that you serve on your system. And then what that, does that mean as it relates to pricing the service and the bills that your customers will face. So, you know, as, as an industry, we've seen various different issues, you know, that the, the water industry is facing, you know, aging infrastructure rates, resiliency costs, you know, you know, trying to generate stable revenue streams. And as utility managers and operators, you all, we try to, you know, manage this system, manage all these issues to provide the best service we can uh, as an entity uh, to, to the customers we serve. Okay? But in the case, you currently have the shadow of, of COVID-19, something that touches every single aspect of your business, every single stakeholder within your community and everything that you do. And as such, we have worked with staff to try to understand how COVID-19 is affecting your operations. And some of those considerations are taken into consideration as a part of the study. One key note to highlight is we are still going through this pandemic. And while we're looking at some initial indicators as it relates to shifts in usage uh, across customer classes, for example, you know, in some, for some utilities from commercial or industrial to residential, you know, in some utilities, you know, differences in production, then you have your, your billing and collections impacts to your billing and collections from a community perspective, higher, you know, unemployment, items of that nature, we're still going through the effects and the current conditions of the pandemic. And as we go through and learn more and understand the implications, we will be better able to, to, to model and, 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 and pan out and, and forecast what could potentially happen going forward. So the, the, the note here is we're considering uh, some of these variables, but we're also going through the pandemic and we're studying it as we go through. So your, your drivers, you know, ultimately what you're trying to do is maintain a sustainable system through revenue stability, being resilient in how you operate, trying to price your service appropriately and engaging and engaging your stakeholders. So, so everybody's understanding uh, of the work and the good job uh, you're doing here at Columbia Walk. Uh, <clears throat> This, this slide just goes about showing the history of, you know, what you have done as it relates to revenue increases, you know, and in the past, the message has been, you know, we have to try to prevent lumps in the rate increases. And early on in this journey, there were a few lumps, but in recent times, um, you've been, you know, able to make, you know, the decisions to pass the increases as such. As we can tell for the upcoming year, there will not be, there's not a proposed rate increase. So there'll be no rate increase going forward. We'll continue to study and look at the impact of everything we do, but we just wanted to highlight this slide to you know, provide some perspective on the journey. Okay. So going into the assumptions. So as it relates to the revenues um, that we forecast you'll generate in FYO 20, uh, currently we have made assumptions to the level of, of, of customer growth, your growth in accounts. Previously, you know, before COVID-19, you know, you were 
at somewhere in the range of a percent, a percent and a quarter. Uh, and given what we see happening, uh, we've made the decision to back down on your growth rate to about three quarters of a percent. Uh, we know and see that over the last few years, there's somewhat been a decline in water usage patterns. So we have kind of maintained our, you know, historical forecast of average use per customer. And we've done that because currently on your system, even though there is, there's been historical decreases, we see where those decreases are kind of flattening out. And we anticipate that there may be, or there could be some more decreases going forward, but we'll continue to, to, to study it as we go forward. So there are two components, your user rate revenues and your other revenue sources. In FYO 20, uh, as the illustration to the right shows, in FY21, I'm sorry, you're anticipated or forecasted, you know, to produce revenues, user rate revenues in the, in the amount of 159.4, that's line three. Uh, other revenue sources in the amount of $11.4 million, uh, line six, for a total system revenues of 170.8, line seven. So this becomes the baseline forecast of, of revenues. As it relates to, to costs, your operating expenses are forecasted to be about 97.2 million in FY21. Uh, as a part of looking at your costs to operate, staff thoroughly went through the impacts COVID-19 could have on current operations, looking at new hires. And we also looked at potential uh, collections and, and delinquencies. And we kind of considered some of these items as we, we kind of looked at the program. Uh, more importantly, we also looked at your current CIP. And as you're aware, traditionally, you've been at a level of about $120 million annually. Last year, we came down to about 80 million and as a result of COVID-19 and what's going on uh, within the community, the proposed CIP uh, for this upcoming year is, is $40 million. Uh, as Mr. Sheely just highlighted, uh, you will still meet and follow the requirements of your Clean Water 2020 program and all the other requirements of uh, resiliently operating your system. Uh, as it relates to debt service, for FY21, you're forecasted to be at about 41.9 million. And then there is what we call PAYGO um, projects that you'll pay for from operations. Ultimately, what we're trying to do here is continue to meet your financial requirements, uh, one of which is debt service coverage, and essentially balance, maintain a balanced approach to your financial planning um, as we've tried to do uh, in the past. So the financial plan, I'm not going to read all the bullets and get too granular, uh, but in essence, there's no rate increases. There's a three quarter of a percent in growth. Uh, the CIP that's proposed uh, is a $40 million CIP in 21. Then we ramp back up to an $80 million CIP in 22. And then for 23, through 25, it's $120 million CIP. Uh, for the program, about 28.9 will be funded uh, with monies from operations and just over 70% would be monies from revenue bonds. Uh, we meet our financial metrics and financial requirements and we go about tendering bond issuances on an annual basis with the issuance in FY. 21 being about 19.5 million. Looking at the details of the financial plan, uh, you can see that as a result of not implementing a rate increase for FY 21, along with meeting uh, your current, you know, cost to operate and other obligations, uh, we're forecasting as of right now, uh, an increase in FY 22 of about 10.15. Now, last year, when we were looking at this and we were starting to plan out, you know, 
how we would build into the future. You know, we, you know, we were looking at maybe, you know, mid single digit increases for this upcoming year, potentially low single digit increases. So as a result of kind of pivoting, adjusting your CIP and taking the necessary, you know, precautions for the betterment of your, your system and most importantly, your, your community, you know, this is one of the, the results as such. What we will say though is, as we go forward, we'll continue to see how we come out of this pandemic and how revenues do and how costs and other requirements do. And next year that 10.5 and the increases uh, thereafter uh, may be lower. But as of right now, this is the forecast, uh, but we just wanted to highlight that point. Okay, continuing. So this is just a summary of the, the, the key results and the key elements, uh, and we kind of highlight it. We met our debt service coverage. That's a split between uh, bond funding and cash, cash funding, and there's no uh, revenue. So what we wanted to do here is uh, provide a scenario that that kind of you know gave a little perspective to us coming out of this pandemic. So the 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 base case scenario, as we highlighted, uh, goes about listing uh, CIP projects, which are forty million as stated before in twenty one, eighty million in twenty two, and then one hundred and twenty for all the years thereafter, twenty three to twenty five. But we then said, if we were at 40 million in 21, what would happen if we were to go right back to 120 million in FY 22 through 25? Uh, and what we see here is that, you know, it would take almost just under a 2% increase in 21, you know, and maybe, you know, just over almost a, a percent and a half in 2023. So I'm sorry, almost a 2% in 22, which would be in addition to the 10.5 that we're forecasting right now. And then almost a percent and a half over the 7.96 that we're forecasting, a half a percent over the 7.96 that we're forecasting in 23. One thing to consider is the earlier the rate increases are put in place, you, you have the time value of money and the compounding impact across the life of the program. So this just provides some perspective on if we were to go back uh, immediately to that 120 million uh, program, what it would look like as of right now, okay? And this here is just another, uh, another perspective uh, and a comparison of, of, of the rate increase or the revenue increases and the CIP as a and in, in both cases, we get to our 2.0 internal debt service coverage re requirement by 2025. Okay, moving on. So what does that mean uh, as it relates to, to billing packs? Okay. You've, you've seen this slide. Uh, and, you know, over since FY, to, since 2008, you know, if we looked at the aggregate rate increase, you know, we'd be at an, an average annual of about 4.3, which tracks at and around inflation. But the bigger message, and you've heard this message before, even with the pandemic and with not doing anything, um, the cost of water um, is re relatively valuable. Um, as compared to if you were to just go to the store and buy a one gallon, uh, you know, bottle of water, right? Uh, and, and for the importance and the necessity of the service, you get a lot uh, for what you pay for this service. So that's, that's all we wanted to highlight here with this slide. And I know for the most part, uh, we've seen this slide previously. Mm -hmm. As it relates to billing packs, 
there's there's no bill impact uh, because there's no rate increase. And from a competitive standpoint, <clears throat> on the water side for the typical residential customer, you're closer to, you know, the middle or lower end uh, from a typical average monthly bill as compared to your neighbors. On the wastewater side, you're, you're at about the same level, but you're somewhat closer to the middle of the pack. Uh, next steps. Uh, what we'll do, we'll continue to work to complete uh, the financial plan and, and cost of service analysis, uh, a part of which would be a, a large user rate analysis. Uh, you know, hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to schedule a meeting to come back and discuss the large user rate analysis, your sewer expansion fees, uh, miscellaneous service charges, and uh, from a policy perspective, um, the economic development fund that staff is trying to, to, to develop. Uh, and when that's completed, we'll, we'll do the draft report, submit the report, and then you know the project will be close to being completed at that point. Uh, thank you all very much for giving us the opportunity uh, to be here and present. Do you all have any questions? When will we have the opportunity to have that meeting to discuss expansion fees and so forth? Do you all have an idea of date? So, Councilman, I'll, I'll take that. This is Clint. Um, uh, that work is is progressing nicely. Um, we didn't want to inundate you today with that discussion. We wanted this to be more about the the, the rates themselves. But um, you know, I think in the next two months we'll be ready to to come back with with those recommendations and um, certainly have maybe a better feel for how COVID nineteen is impacting the the utility and the finances. And that may actually be something that could be folded into that discussion as well. So. Um, Robert's done quite a bit of work on that already, and um, we just uh, purposely decided to focus on rates today. All right. Any other questions of Robert or Clint? Right. Mayor, I would just like to, to mention one last thing. The, the future rate scenarios that, that Robert proposed, um, did not assume any schedule relief from EPA for consent decree deliverables. So if we are successful in those negotiations, those um, you know capital spends could look a little different. And so there is some flexibility, we hope. Um, we'd still like to stay well ahead of that curve um, with the spend, but uh, that did not assume any, any relief there. So I just wanted to mention that. So this is a very conservative presentation, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. All right. Good deal. Manager. Unmute there, sir. Um, so we're pretty much on schedule. Thank you, Clint and Robert, for picking up some time there for us. Um, we will now entertain Mr. Mayor if you are ready to go into executive session. All right. All right, Mr. Duval. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion we go into executive session for receipt of legal advice related to matters covered by attorney-client privilege pursuant to SC Code 30-4-70A2, legal advice pertaining to COVID-19, personal health review of certificate, discussion of negotiations incident to proposed contractual arrangements pursuant to 30-4-70A2, Bull Street Park. Thank you so much, Howard. Uh, is there a second? Second. Good discussion. Uh, one of the biggest questions, Carl, Carl Roll. And thank everyone so much uh, for your participation, staff. Fantastic presentations. Let's, uh, keep, let's keep moving forward. Uh, move the previous question, Carl, Carl Roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. 
Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Thank you, 